Welcome to BIA, Canada's top black media provider. Whether you're looking for shows on fashion, art, music, or simple lifestyle, we bring you the best content the black community in Canada has to offer and so much more. And better yet, do you have an idea for a project you'd like us to help you with? We provide equipment, studio, and office space, as well as a team of dedicated individuals to help you bring those ideas to life. So don't wait. Check out our new website at biamedia.ca for more information on how to contact us and start creating today. BIA Media. Your media, your way. Let's start now. Play that again, because that way we can have it on, on, on the recording. Okay. All right. You, you, you started? Okay. All right, everybody. Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're in week three of our sessions of uh, our course, Early History, the African Renaissance, 1896 to the Present. Again, we're coming uh, from the studio of BIA Media, um, and uh, uh, there's a nice uh, recording of their, what's going on here. Um, we'll play it at the end. We'll play it at the end. So you'll hear a commercial at the end that's telling you about all the services for BIA Media. So again, it's a collaboration with BIA Media, Jaku Combat. For those of you I don't know, I'm Dr. Clyde Ledbetter, and this is week three. So as always, just to recap of how we do things, I lecture for about 25 to 30 minutes, then we have a recorded Q&A, then I lecture for another 25 to 30 minutes, then I turn off the recording, we have open discussion. So if you have a question or a comment that you don't mind being recorded, you can ask it in the first uh, uh, Q&A. The person letting you in and the person that's also facilitating the slides today that you, that'll be shared with you is my permanent uh, teaching assistant. Well, not permanent because eventually he's gonna become a professor. Uh, and a bookstore owner and author and so many great things. But right now he's a student. He just finished his third year at Temple University in the Department of African American and African Studies and Africology. Daniel Roberts III has been helping me out for about a year and a half now. So uh, Daniel is with us and we're going to go ahead and get started. Last week, we talked about the Garvey movement uh, and it's the uh, thing. Um, some reason it went off. Here we go. Last week, we talked about the Garvey movement and we discussed its impact, its global impact. There's never been a movement of African people as large as the Garvey movement. And we talked about its impact in the Caribbean, in the Americas, uh, North and South, as well as in Europe and, of course, back home in Africa. Today, we're going to continue with uh, the influences of Garvey. And we're going to move up in time. So we started the class in 1896 and we moved to about 1915. Then we went from 1915 to about 1930, 1927, when Garvey uh, uh, gets uh, uh, deported from the U.S. Today, we're going to go from around 1925 uh, to 1945. And we're going to be talking about two major movements. Uh, the New Negro Movement and the Negritude Movement. And really, this is the first part of our class. We'll be talking about these two literary and artistic and philosophical movements and how they were related to each other and how they brought artists and activists together uh, all over the African world. Then we'll take a break. And then we will talk about the African experience during World War II, but particularly with the focus on the Italian invasion of Ethiopia and how that uh, the effort uh, to fight back against that. Because remember, we started this class talking about the symbol of Ethiopia, how Ethiopia was able to defeat the Italians in 1896. But guess what? Just like in Star Wars, the empire strikes back and the Italians come back in, in 1935 and try to recapture Ethiopia. And Africans all over the world say, no, 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 no. We've been influenced by Garvey. We've been influenced by the Negritude movement, the New Negro movement, and the New Negro has no fear. So we will help fight uh, the Italians as well. So we'll talk about that in the second part of the class. So the movement uh, that we'll start with our class with in the meeting that we start with, because remember this time around this year, we're talking about movements and meetings. We're talking about the Negritude movement, the New Negro movement. And instead of focusing on one particular meeting with one particular date, we're going to be looking in our focal point will be a series of meetings that took place at the Nardal Salon in Paris, the salon owned 
uh, when I say salon, not a place where you get your hair done, but a literary salon, a place where artists and writers could come together, discuss their works, debate uh, blackness and these ideas in the 1930s in Paris, uh, owned by the Martinique and Paulette Nardal um, and frequented by artists that we'll talk about today. Uh, and a lot of this was happening in uh, the early 30s, but we'll focus on March 1931. It's kind of our focal point date. That was the publication of uh, Paulette Nardal's uh, journal, which was a uh, great connective tissue the, between the New Negro movement and the Negritude movement. And it's always interesting. Uh, we talked about it in week one with uh, Charlotte McKK, and we talked about Booker T. Washington and Garvey and all of these connective tissues, these people that brought the African world together. Paulette Nardal is one of them. So we'll be talking about how the reclamation of African pride and African culture uh, laid the basis for resistance against colonialism and all forms of exploitation and uh, discrimination against black folks around the world in the years between 1925 and 1945. And then we'll also talk about how Africans, those at home and, and abroad, responded to the uh, uh, Ethiopian invasion of Italy. All right, so key term number, this is actually key term number three, because we had Ethiopianism in week one, uh, we had Pan-Africanism in week two, I think that was our term, and week three, negritude. So Daniel, if you don't mind sharing this so that folks at home uh, can see what uh, is on the screen. Negritude, the definition that you should know. A literary style based on the following core values. Number one, a rejection of European proclaimed hegemony in all things. When we say the word hegemony, it's just a big word that means dominance. So Europeans, uh, through colonialism and slavery, created white supremacy and the belief that European culture and European things should dominate the entire world. Negritude was rejection of that. Rejection of Western colonialism and domination. Three, the full acceptance of blackness, because we're going to talk about why, what Negritude was in response to French assimilation, and we'll talk about what that was. The full acceptance of blackness, full recognition of black history, traditions, cultures, and ways of being, the renunciation of the false consciousness of hierarchy, superiority, and division instilled into peoples of African descent across the globe. And then finally, number six, the integration and adoption of various Marxist ideologies. Um, and that comes toward the end of negritude, this idea of a class analysis, as well as a reclamation of African culture. Now, this all this uh, breakdown of negritude comes from uh, a, a reference entry written by uh, Dr. Ama Mazama, who's at Temple University, who's a great Afrocentric uh, scholar. Uh, so she gives us this breakdown of negritude. So know these six elements of negritude, and we'll talk about them as we uh, go forward. So Paulette Nardal, Paulette Nardal, who was she? She was from Martinique. She was one of the famous uh, of the seven Nardal sisters. So the Nardals had seven daughters, and they were all uh, uh, prodigious in everything they did. Some were artists, some were uh, 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 scholars, but these were great women. Um, and Paula Nordahl is also, I think, the second woman to actually graduate from the Sorbonne, and she majored in uh, English. So she was a poet, an activist, uh, a philosopher in many ways, but for our purposes, she's. we're going to look at her as, again, a person that created the space for African people to come together uh, to share ideas. And in fact, one of the fathers of Negritude, Leopold Senghor, uh, who also went on to become president, first president of Senegal, he said, it is thanks to Paulette Nordahl, the Martinican, founders of Le Revue, Le Revue des Mondes Noirs, or the, the Review of the Black World. And I'm apologize right from the get-go. I don't speak French. <laughs> I, well, I've been in Ottawa for a couple of years. I need to learn the language. I need to learn French. I'm working on it. Uh, I didn't think I was going to end up in Canada, so I learned Spanish when I was a kid. I didn't learn French, so I might be butchering some things in French today, so I pray for forgiveness from all of you. But the Review of the Black World, this was her uh, six, I think it was about six issues of this publication, which opened up the uh, door for the New Negro Movement to connect with Francophone Africans and Francophone uh, folks of African descent from the Caribbean. Uh, in the 30s, that I met Elaine Locke. We're gonna talk about Elaine Locke, who writes the book, The New Negro. And we talked about Elaine Locke in our last class on the African student movement. Uh, Mercer Cook, 
uh, thanks to the Guyanese uh, Leon DeMar that I met, Langston Hughes and County Cullen. These are big names. These are big names. Now, I don't uh, pretend to be an expert in black literature. I studied it. Um, my older cousin is, uh, and, and Daniel's uncle, uh, Brian Roberts, is an expert in black literature. Um, but I studied it and I know it. So the things that we're going to talk about today and these literary names, I encourage all of you to look up their works. I put a lot of their works on our course website, so make sure you check that out. Uh, so these names will be, be these are this is an all star list of names. When we talk about Leon DeMont, Langston Hughes, County Cullen, uh, met and especially read. It is thus that in the general sense of the word of the world, the Negritude movement, the discovery of black values and the Negro's awareness of his situation was born in the United States of America. This is accurate in terms of his uh, appraisal of the importance of Paulette Nordahl. But really, uh, Sangor is, uh, gives the U.S. too much credit in this because the Negritude movement and the New Negro movement were interconnected from the very beginnings. And it wasn't just a one-way uh, exchange. It goes back and forth, and it really starts a little bit earlier. And I got to shout out Rene Moran. He's the first black person to win the uh, pre uh, Grand Corps. And those of you that are in the, uh, that speak French uh, probably know what that is. It's like the, uh, for the English speaking folks, it's like the Pulitzer Prize uh, for French writing. And he was the first uh, African to, a black person to win this award in 19, it was either 1919 or 1920, when he wrote this book, uh, Bato Ola. Bato Ola, which was uh, a book that a novel that exposed French colonialism in Central Africa. Now, Rene Moran was from Martinique or Guyana, one of the two, um, but his parents were in the colonial service of the French. So he grew up in Africa and actually became a part of the colonial service itself. And as he has observed French colonialism in Africa, he writes this novel about this African chief that was resisting. Well, the novel went on to, to again, win this uh, great prize in, in French literature, the first black to win it. And then it got translated into English. And the novel went on uh, to be influenced uh, uh, Du Bois, W.B. Du Bois, who we talked about last week, uh, who wrote a brilliant review of the novel. Uh, it talked about how it exposed French colonialism. Uh, it opened up the eyes of black folks to what was going on in, in the French colonies in Africa, because they didn't really uh, know, uh, really. Um, so, but the problem with this is he, he won the prize, but then he suffered because of it, because the French didn't like the fact that he exposed what uh, was going on. So he lost a, a lot of his power in terms of his uh, being a colonial uh, uh, um, uh, administrator. He uh, was criticized for um, his criticism of the blacks who supported French colonialism, because there were a lot that did. And they felt that you know he was uh, uh, unduly harsh on the French and so many other things. But this book is a, a key uh, uh, literary piece in this puzzle that connects Negritude to the New Negro movement. So unlike what Sangor said that, you know, it comes from the U.S., the, the folks in the U.S. read this, which was written by an African, a French-speaking person of African descent from the Caribbean who lived in Chad, who wrote this book, and then this book goes and influences the New Negro movement. So after reading this book, um, we, there are some other influences that we need to talk about. So this makes its way to the Americas. Just in terms of time, so we can get a, a, an understanding of where we're at in this uh, 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 time period. We started the class in 1896 with the Battle of Ottawa. Now we are around here. And during the same time period that we're talking about, one of the other things, major things that are going on are the, is the U.S. occupation of Haiti. And this is also going to play a key role in our discussion today. So I just kind of wanted to show you where we're at in the timeline. And this is only the first half of the 20th century. Um, also on the continent, I just wanted to also point this out. 1929, we also have the Igbo Women's War. Uh, this is another key event that we should know. The reason why I bring this up, because a lot of our discussion in the first part of class today is going to be focused on events that were happening outside of Africa, in Paris, in Harlem. 
But I don't want us to forget that the resistance to colonization still was happening on the continent itself. We can never, that's where 90% of black folks live. So we don't uh, neglect what was going on in the continent. And these ideas of negritude, the new Negro movement, were really movements of uh, the elite and the scholarly classes who needed to be reminded of their Africanness. The people on the ground and the masses, the people that were with Garvey, didn't need to be reminded of their negritude or their blackness or their Africanness because they were already in it. It's only the alienated elite that had to come back to black. But anyway, the Igbo women's war was happening at this time. And just, I don't talk, I'm not going to go into detail about it, but I just wanted to show you what collective uh, struggle looked like for black women in Nigeria. These sisters were responding to the British deciding that they were going to tax uh, the economic activity of women. That took it too far. Because if you know anything about uh, who controls the markets in Africa, it's the women, particularly in West Africa, it's the women. So taxing the labor of men, that's one thing. When you start getting involved in women's business, that's a whole nother thing. So the women uprose in Nigeria. Uh, they started attacking the Africans. Uh, next slide, Daniel. They started attacking the Africans that worked for the colonial apparatus. And these were known as warrant chiefs. And you knew who they were because the British had given them these little hats to show that they were special. So they started removing these, these men's hats, these sellouts hats. They started looting factories and burning down native court buildings and uh, where you know, the British used their uh, middlemen to uh, uh, dispense, quote unquote, justice. They started blocking train tracks and attacking all forms of colonial infrastructure, cutting telegraph wires, releasing prisoners from colonial jails, destroying and confiscating colonial property. These sisters uh, uh, <laughs> weren't playing until the British had to realize that, OK, we, we're going to have to repeal that tax. We can't tax these women because uh, they're, they're not for it. So this was going on on the continent. There were other forms of resistance. I just wanted to bring that up. But uh, the another form of resistance on the other side of the world was in Haiti. The U.S. in 1915 had decided to occupy Haiti. We talk about this in detail in one of our other classes, um, the Caribbean. Con Actually, we talked about this last year in this class when we focused on Haiti. Uh, so you can learn more about that. It's on the, one of the recordings on our course website. But as this was happening, the Haitians resisted. Uh, they fought against the Marines uh, throughout the entire invasion. Um, and uh, one of the martyrs of this, one of the great African world leaders at this time, was Charlemagne Peralta, who died in 1919, the same year that uh, uh, René Moran published uh, his book on French colonialism in Africa. Charlemagne Peralta died uh, as a result of fighting U.S. colonialism in Haiti. While the occupation of the U.S. Uh, of Haiti was going on, we get another great literary figure emerge. Next slide, Daniel. Uh, and that is John uh, Price Mars. And he writes one of the most influential books called uh, So Spoke the Uncle, written in 1928. And it advocated for a reclamation of the African in Haitian history and in Haitian culture. And this idea known as noirism, noirism. This is a precursor to negritude, and this is coming out of Haiti. So we're seeing around this time, we got the Garvey movement, we got the New Negro movement in Harlem, which we're going to talk about. And now in Haiti, uh, not as a result of the occupation, but the occupation brought with it U.S. racism. It brought with it a betrayal of the Haitian masses by many of the Haitian elite that still had this occupation with France in, in their minds. Um, John Price Mars, who was a physician, an ethnologist, a diplomat, an educator, he writes this book that reinforced the recognition of voodoo as the religion of the masses. He called for the elites to serve the masses instead of serving their own interests. And then he founded the Africology Chair in the Institute of Ethnology in Haiti in 1941. So he writes this very influential book. What's he arguing for? Going back to African culture. African culture is what helped liberate Haiti from enslavement, going back to uh, the Bois Cayman ceremony in 1791. So he's saying, why are you trying to ape the French or now with the occupation trying to ape the Americans? You have your own culture. There's value in it. Go back into it. If you're of the elite, the rich class, don't neglect the masses. Rejoin the masses spiritually, economically, politically, all of these things. Sangor also wrote, 
When I was in Paris, as I read, thus spoke the uncle in one gulp, like the water in the cistern in the evening. Um, next slide, Daniel. Uh, after a long stage, and this is, a, 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 again, one of the founders of Negritude, Leopold Sango from Senegal. As I read, thus spoke the uncle in one gulp, like the water in the cistern in the evening. After a long stage in the desert, I was overwhelmed. Uncle legit legitimized the reasons for my quest, confirmed what I had sensed, because telling me about the treasures of negritude that he had discovered on and in Haitian soil, he taught me to discover the same values, but pristine and stronger in, on and in the land of Africa. So we're seeing this exchange again. Haitian influencing Leopold Sango, and he probably got a, a copy of Thus Spoke to Uncle from hanging out in the salon with Paulette Nardal and her sisters as when he was a student in Paris in the early 1930s. So again, going back to Paulette Nardal, 1931, she publishes The Review of the Black World. And let's see some of the people that are uh, uh, in this. John Price Mars, The Problem of uh, uh, Work in Haiti. He's published. This is the first issue. Claude McKay, the great Jamaican uh, uh, poet, is published in it. And, and these other names, these are giants in uh, uh, the black world. So she's publishing these, these folks and presenting these to the students that are in Paris. We talk about the English speaking African student movement in England and in North America in our last and, uh, uh, session. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about the French student movement, but you had students uh, from Senegal, you had students from Mali, you had students from Martinique, of course, and, and, and Guadeloupe and uh, Haiti, all studying at the same time in Paris. And they were forming student associations. Paulette Nardal was bringing the works from all over the African world and presenting them in this journal. Uh, we can't, there's no way, this is just like the Negro world when we talked about Garvey's newspaper. Uh, it brought folks together. And then she opened up her home as a salon to further bring people together. There's, there's, I can't talk about just how important this woman was, Paulette Nordahl. But I love what she says, what the aim of this was. The aim of the review was to give the intelligentsia of the black race and their partisans an official organ to which to publish their artistic, literary, and scientific work, to study and to popularize by means of the press, books, lectures, courses, all which concerns Negro civilization and the natural riches of Africa, uh, thrice sacred to the black race. Um, this is the importance of this. And I think it only lasted a, a few issues, but luminaries were in this book. So Paulette Nardal is our connective tissue. One of the people that she published and one of the people that she brought over to France that sat in her salon that met with these students, Elaine Locke. Elaine Locke wrote the foundational text of the New Negro movement, which many people know as the Harlem Renaissance, called The New Negro. Uh, this book, huge book, I don't have a copy of it with me today, um, published folks like Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, County Collin, Claude McKay. He was a professor at Howard University, and we talked about in our last course who was his student? Nandi Ezekwe, the first president of Nigeria, the founder uh, of uh, the, uh, one of the founders of the African Student Association of North America, all while being a student at Howard University and studying under Elaine Locke. So we're seeing all of these connections. One of the greatest poems of this period, I'm gonna read a couple of poems so you can kind of get a sense of what the new Negro movement was about. Everybody should know this poem. Our children should be forced to memorize this poem when they're in school. This was written by the Jamaican Claude McKay. Again, another one of these travelers, one of these Af people of African descent that was up in Harlem, that was traveling throughout the US and throughout uh, 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 Europe. Again, one of the visitors of Paulette Nardal's salon. And he wrote this great poem called, If We Must Die. He writes it in 1919. And this was published in The New Negro. And I think in the crisis, the NAACP's newspaper. But he says, if we must die, and this is in result, this is in reaction to the spat of lynchings that occurred in the United States in 1919. 1919 was known as the Red Summer, and that name was given to it uh, by a number of people. Um, and it also comes from the 
publication done by the journalist Ida B. Wells Barnett called The Red Record, where she went around uh, a very uh, courageous black woman, black journalist and activist who went around uh, documenting all the lynchings that took place in the United States, why they happened and, and, and who was involved and what. And what she found was most folks were lynched in the United States for economic reasons. Black person doing well, have a store, the store is doing better than the white stores. The whites come up with some excuse, say, oh, he raped a white woman or attempted to rape a white woman. And then he was lynched. And the whole white community, I won't say whole, but a, a good amount of the white community would come out and, and to the lynching and, uh, you know, the mutilated bodies and all of that. And they would have, you know, a barbecue underneath the dead body of a black man. And I'm not making this up because they took pictures. They took pictures of these things of the whole white community out underneath the body. You can look those things up. So he's responding to that. And then in 1919, it's really significant because black people had just come back. Black Americans had just come back for fighting in World War One. Black Africans had fought in World War One of the great European, the first great European tribal war of the 20th century. They fought for France. They fought for England. They contributed to the war effort. And in the United States, they come back. And they're lynching black men in their service outfits to show that just because you fight, you're still a nigga. So he's responding to this. And he writes, if we must die, if we must die, let it not be like dog, hogs, hunted and pinned in inglorious spot, while around us bark the mad hungry dogs making their mock at our cursed lot. If we must die, let us die, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain, then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, uh, and for their thousand blows do one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men will face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. This is the spirit of the New Negro movement. This is why... During uh, the, the Garvey uh, 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 parade in New York in 1920 that we talked about last week, what was on that car? The new Negro has no fear. They're talking about fighting back. This is one of the great poems. Also during this time, it was published in the new Negro, the works of Zora Neale Hurston, the great anthropologist and writer. She's most famous for her novel, uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Uh, but she also uh, did uh, anthropological work in Haiti and in Jamaica called Tell My Horse. Voodoo and life, voodoo uh, and life uh, in Haiti and Jamaica, where she went and she actually got initiated into uh, the traditional African religion of voodoo in Haiti. And she writes about African traditions in Haiti and in Jamaica as she, when she traveled there. So she's also an important figure of the Harlem Renaissance. Of course, Langston Hughes, probably the most well known poet of the Harlem Renaissance. And like myself, a graduate of the first historically black college at Lincoln University, I always got to throw that in when I talk about Langston Hughes. Uh, but he writes one of his great works of the New Negro Movement, The Weary Blues. It's a collection of poetry. I put a copy of it on our course website if you want to read it. But the first poem, the proem, or the prologue to his book of poetry, this is what he writes. I am a Negro, black as the night is black, black like the depths of my Africa. I've been a slave. Caesar told me to keep his doorsteps clean. I brushed the boots of Washington. I've been a worker. Under my hand, the pyramids arose. I made mortar for the Woolworth, Woolworth building. I've been a singer. All the way from Africa to Georgia, I carried my sorrow songs. I made ragtime. I've been a victim. The Belgians cut off my hands in the Congo. They lynch me now in Texas. I am a Negro. Black as the night is black. Black like the depths of my Africa. This is the first poem in this collection. What is he doing? He's connecting himself to Africa, not just Africa present, but Africa past. Under my hand, the pyramids arose. So from the beginning, the, the new Negro movement is saying, look, just because we're African-Americans, we're connected to what's going on in the continent in the past and in the present. This is important. I won't sing this, <laughs> but I sing it every morning with my son. And this is another important piece of the new Negro movement, Lift Every Voice and Sing, the Negro National Anthem. Um, and this is the most famous stanza, but there's two other stanzas, or two other uh, uh, verses, yeah, stanzas. Um, but, you know, Lift Every Voice and Sing, 
written by James Weldon Johnson. Again, another one of these giants of the New Negro movement. I'm going to move a little faster. Augustus Savage, because it wasn't just a poetry and a literature, move, a liter a literature movement. It's also a movement of visual arts. So you have the great sculptures of Augustus Savage. Again, another frequent visitor of Paulette Nardal in France. Um, it extended out of the U.S. into Cuba with the works of Nicholas Guillen, Motivos de Sun, in 1930 he published this. And he starts the Negrismo movement, Negrismo, blackness in the Spanish-speaking world. So he's an Afro-Cuban. Um, and, uh, you know, he would live through, he was exiled from Cuba. He came back after the revolution uh, and lived there. Uh, and, and was honored. So Negrismo. So it wasn't just in the French speaking and the English speaking, also in the Spanish speaking world. The works of Romar Bearden, a great uh, 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 painter. One thing about Negritude, and I'm going to move kind of fast and we'll take our first break. One thing about Negritude is this. Paulette Nordahl, uh, she the French did a good job. Go the next slide, Daniel. The French did a, a really good job. They, even with the Negritude movement, many of its early leaders still had a connection to France. They still wanted to keep that connection with France because here's what France did with its colonization. And Dan, you can stop sharing for a second. I'll go back to this because I, I I want people to to, to grasp to grasp this. The English and the French and the Portuguese and the Belgians and the Germans, they did their colonial projects in different ways. I'll just compare the English and the French. The English, wherever they colonized, they made sure Africans knew that they were black and they were less than. You will never be an Englishman. The only reason we're teaching you English is so that we can get access to the resources better, so that we can exploit your labor better. We need to train some of you as colonial administrators because many English people don't want to actually go to Nigeria and to Ghana and to Jamaica, excuse me, but we want the resources. And this carries over into the United States too. You guys, you, you, you're niggers with, with a hard, hard ER. You're niggers, you will never be English people. Uh, that was their position. The French was a little bit more slick. The French say, we, want, we're, we, we value French culture so much, we want to assimilate some of you. Not all of you are gonna make it, but some of you, if you speak French good enough, if you learn French culture good enough, you can be Frenchmen. In fact, unlike the British, we're gonna allow some of you to actually join the French parliament and represent the colonies, not in any equal numbers, because then you would outnumber the French and then you would you know, end colonialism. But we'll let a uh, few of you from Senegal and a couple other places, Martinique, actually join the French uh, parliament and have a little bit of say. Oh, we're only going to pick the good ones, not, not if you, you're a rebel rouser. Uh, so we'll, we'll let you, you know, come in and you can be Frenchmen. You just have to learn. So because of that, and this goes way back, I mean, even after the Haitian Revolution, we still see the elite, even though they're free from France politically and economically, mentally, spiritually, they're still tied up with France because they, they just couldn't break it. So even Paul Lenore Dolph or everything that she did, uh, she said, one must not commit the error of considering us to be militants in some political party or another. We only feel very strong the necessity of having the black man re-enter the fellowship of mankind and to rid him of his complexes, at least the Antillian or the West Indian. Uh, all that is very compatible with our very deep attachment to France, our great country. We find the idea of independence for the Antilles stupid. This is what she said. She said she finds the idea of independence stupid. Not everybody in the Negritude movement felt like this. A new generation arose, not, not really a new generation, but younger folks. And they were much more militant than Parlette Nordahl. Uh, and they published uh, 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 two journals. One, uh, the Black Student, and this was an association of Black students, for, uh, first from Martinique, but then later on led by the students from Senegal and, and, and West Africa. Leopold Sangor was the leader of the students from Africa, and uh, Ami Cezaire uh, was the leader of the students from uh, uh, the West Indies, uh, and also uh, Leon Demar. And they also published uh, Legitimate Defense. Uh, defense is legitimate. Th this article. These were more radical journals 
They published uh, poetry and essays, but much more radical than what was Paulette Nardal was doing. Uh, then in 1937, we get uh, Leon Demas, who's from French Guiana, his book, Pigments. This book was banned by the French. They said this is way too radical of a book. When he's talking about ending colonization, he's talking about ending racism. They, the French banned this book. Uh, so this is the direction that Negritude was going into. And then it really comes to life. And in fact, all, all the way up until 1939, no one had actually used the term Negritude to define this movement. The word Negritude really comes out of uh, the poem by Ami Césaire's uh, notebook on the return to my country. Um, this is when the term Negritude is first used. And then his discourse on colonialism, which comes out a little bit a lot later in 1950, really breaks the doors open uh, on uh, the uh, critiques of colonization and the return to African culture. Um, and then, of course, we have Sangor's work as well. But Frantz Fanon, who was a Mie Césaire student in Martinique, and we'll talk about Fanon in a couple of weeks, uh, he says, before Césaire, the West, Indi West Indian literature was a literature of Europeans. The West Indian identified himself with the white man, adopted the white man's attitudes, and was a white man until Ami Césaire, until uh, uh, um, uh, Leopold Sangor, and uh, uh, until Leon Dema really broke negritude open uh, and, uh, exp and really got stronger with their critiques of French colonialism. Uh, so that's where we'll, we'll stop there for, for now, because uh, we'll take a break, because a lot of this interaction really started to uh, dissip not dissipate completely, but uh, the interaction wasn't as strong because the second European tribal war had begun. So the travel between the US and, 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 and France and these things was kind of halted for a minute because everybody was focused on the European tribal war. But for African people, the quote unquote world war started a lot longer before uh, Hitler invaded Poland. It's when the Italians invaded Ethiopia. And we're going to talk about the African response to that after we come back from our break, our first Q&A. So Daniel, uh, let me know what's in the chat. And if folks have questions, they can uh, use the raise your hand feature and, and ask your question. You can be unmuted. And um, yeah, let me know what's uh, in the chat. We got anything, Daniel? Okay, I don't see anything in the there is um, one raised his hand. Um, Mr. Raimi was semi go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks, Dr. Kite, for this amazing presentation. Uh, I was wondering to speak to the, to the movement um, it, um, in Europe. So we had friends, the French and, and, the, and the British. We also developed the uh, British, the Afghan and also the Netherlands, also colonized Africa. And I was curious about the approach they used to colonization um, compared to the one you just described, uh, the approach of the French and the approach of the British. Uh, the Belgians were the most ruthless uh, and did, see, at least they, they're all different. So the Germans, uh, Extermination in Namibia, that was their policy. Exter the extermination in, uh, in Namibia. Um, the, the Portuguese in Africa, one of their main tactics was to uh, literally create you know, a mestizo class, a mixed class. So it was almost like you, the, the, the politics of procreation creating a mixed uh, population to oversee the colonies in Angola and Mozambique and places like that. That was the, what the Portuguese did. The Belgians did nothing but exploit, nothing but exploit. I mean, when we look at what happened in the Congo compared to, let's say, uh, the, the French colonies, the British colonies, at least the British and the French uh, attempted to try to you know, flower up their colonialism by building a few hospitals, a, a few universities, a few schools, uh, some roads, these type of things. The Belgians said, we want the resources. We will uh, exploit as many Africans as we can to get the resources. We'll open it up for other European and American companies to come in and get the resources. And we're going to treat this place, uh, the, the, 
the Congo as almost like an, an open warehouse and the people are just there uh, to be exploited or be exterminated. So the Belgians did the bare minimum in terms of colonization. Um, and it shows by the time we get to independence uh, what, what's going to happen. Um, so, yeah, that that that's kind of the differences, if that makes sense. The Belgians were the hyper, uh, even the other European powers, particularly in the first part of the 20th century, the early part of the 20th century, when it was just really King Leopold's personal property, even the the, the British and the French were like, hey, you got to you got to calm down because uh, the, you're making the entire uh, colonial project seem more brutal than we actually want it to seem. Uh, so they that. Yeah. Is that does that kind of answer uh, somewhat? Yes, it does. It does. Thank you very much. Yeah. Anything else in the chat, Daniel, or any other hands? Um, yes, Gloria has her hand up and then Mr. Francis. Okay. Um, yes, this is Gloria. Um, it's very opportune, Dr. Mendoza, that you're talking about poetry and particularly Claude McKay today. Because those of us who joined the Jackal Convict Chair exercise last Wednesday, at the end of the session, we somehow started talking about poetry. Mm. And we actually uh, mentioned that we must die. Oh. But um, one thing, one thing to note is that when Churchill was motivating the British people, he actually quoted from this one. Oh. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, they use us, but then when we start asking for independence, then it's uh, uh, it's an, <laughs> that's that's interesting. I'm I'm glad that uh, you guys were having that discussion. Um, wow, I didn't know Churchill did that, but that's that's funny. Uh, yes, ma'am. Mr. Francis, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I wonder if you can compare and contrast the American invasion of Haiti with that of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. How will they differ? To be honest, the next invasion that we're going to talk about is probably more analogous when the Italians invade Ethiopia is much more analogous to the Russians invading uh, uh, Ukraine. The U.S. invasion of Haiti is much more. It's kind of a precursor to the U.S. invasion of so many other places in the 20th century, whether it's uh, Vietnam or uh, Libya or uh, Afghanistan or Iraq or Grenada. Um, the U.S. always picks on people that they think they can beat, but usually they can't because the U U.S. doesn't win wars after World War II. Yes, <laughs> they didn't win in Korea, they didn't win in Vietnam, they ever won. Uh, they didn't win in Afghanistan, they didn't really win in Iraq. Um, so those are more analogous. Now, Russia invading Ukraine is because Russia believes that there are territories in Ukraine that uh, Russia should have. Uh, there are... Russia is uh, reacting to what happened in 2014, where basically it was a U.S.-backed coup in Ukraine. There's a whole bunch of other things going on. Uh, but essentially, that's more analogous to the Italians invading Ethiopia. Um, the way, the aggression that they came in with, the use of territory, a territorial dispute, because the Italians had controlled. Uh, in fact, that's a good question. It actually leads us into into the next the next next thing. So I'm going to answer that as I talk about what happened uh, with the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, because that's a much more uh, analogous um, a situation. So let me go back a little bit. 1930, Ethiopia comes back on the radar again with uh, the coronation of Haile Selassie. And Daniel, if you don't mind uh, sharing your screen as well. 1930. The film of Rastafari Makonan. Ras is a title. Uh, it, it means uh, prince, uh, essentially. Uh, and Tafari Makonan was crowned the Nagusa Negus, the king of kings, the emperor of Ethiopia in 1930, November 10th, 1930. And it was filmed. And this film went all over the African world. Remember, like I said, Ethiopia was like the real life Wakanda to people at the time. It was the symbol. So 
you know, there's not a lot of black people on film at this time. We got some black filmmakers like Oscar Michaud, and then later on, we're going to have the Senegalese filmmaker Usman Sabini. And we did a whole class on uh, the history of black cinema. Um, and that's on our course website, too, if you want to see those lectures. We might run that back again soon. But anyway, this film went all over the world. Black people was like, oh, we got a new black king that we can celebrate and everything. So Ethiopia was again in the consciousness of black folks. And then Garvey had already said, look to an African king and you'll know redemption is close at hand. So again, Ethiopia was the only independent space. But the Italians controlled Somalia. The Italians controlled Eritrea. So while this is, while Ethiopia, the empire of Ethiopia has this new emperor, empire, the Italians have never forgotten what happened in 1896. They never forgot. Uh, next slide, Dan. They never, they never forgot. They, they, a new fascist regime comes under Mussolini in, uh, in Italy. And Mussolini's big ideas is about, you know, restoring Italy to the uh, glory of the Roman Empire. You know, you got these Europeans with these grandiose ideas, you know, like uh, Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin. They want to build new empires. Stalin wants to build a new Russian empire. Uh, you know, uh, Hitler wants the Third Reich and then Mussolini wants to create the Roman Empire. So part of that and part of the embarrassment the Italians were facing was that they're the only Europeans to lose <laughs> to an African power. So they wanted to come back and avenge that. So they used a territorial dispute the same way that the uh, one of the justifications that the Russians are, are, are using for what's going on in Ukraine, a territorial dispute uh, around this region where Ethiopia meets Somalia as a pretext for going in and invading Ethiopia. Uh, and that happens uh, in 1935. So they come from Italian Somalia and they start invading Ethiopia. And then they also come down from Eritrea and try to pincher in Ethiopia. And the Ethiopians fight. Uh, they're not, the, the Italians are making incredible advances and they're doing so in the most brutal ways. They're using, uh, go to one, one more slide, Daniel. Uh, they're going to, because these, these two kind of look familiar. Yeah, that one. Uh, they use chemical warfare. They use gas, which was outlawed after the first European war. Not, nobody's supposed to be using uh, mustard gas and those types of things in war. There was supposed to be international law about how wars are supposed to be fought. The Italians broke all of these international laws. The first one, by invading another sovereign country, another member of the League of Nations, uh, which Ethiopia was, uh, the Italians had no regard for that. And Selassie actually goes, Selassie is forced to retreat from Ethiopia and go to England because he, at first he's thinking, okay, Ethiopia, just like Japan and, 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 and France and Italy, they're part of the League of Nations. This body that was set up after the first great European tribal war uh, so that there would be no more world wars, that countries could have a place where they can negotiate their, their, their issues with one another and solve things peacefully. So when the Italians invade, this is a direct violation of the charter of the League of Nations. So Selassie comes and he says, the Italian provo provocation was obvious and I did not hesitate to appeal to the League of Nations. I invoked the provisions of the Treaty of 1928, the principles of the covenant. I urged the procedure of conciliation and arbitration. Unhappily for Ethiopia, this was the time when a certain government considered that the European situation made it imperative at all costs to obtain the friendship of Italy. He's talking about the rise of Hitler. The price paid was the abandonment of Ethiopian independence to the greed of the Italian government. White folks said, Ethiopia, you're on your own. The League of Nations really just applies to what's going on among white people. We don't really, we're not going to protect you. We're not going to use collective uh, punishment because that was supposed to, well, that is what was supposed to happen with the League of Nations. If somebody violated the covenant, the other countries would, would come to its defense and then that the aggressor country would back down because they'd be in the face of all these other countries. The other European countries said, we don't care. We need Italy on our side, particularly because we're not sure about what this Hitler guy is going to do. So we're not going to support you. And Ethiopia had to go it alone. But there were people that were definitely willing to support Ethiopia. And these were the Africans at home and abroad. So as soon as the Italians invaded, the Ethiopians were ready to meet the challenge. Next slide, then. They were, they were ready to meet the challenge. And we're talking about the Patriots. These were 
youth, as young as uh, teenagers, to anyone that could carry a gun or, or make a weapon any way that they could, and they fought the Italians. Now, they didn't have the advanced weaponry of the Italians, but they weren't, you know, uh, 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 fighting with sticks either. They fought a guerrilla war. They fought guerrilla campaigns. They knew they couldn't match the Italians one on one. So they let the Italians come in a little bit and then they attacked them. Even when the Italians invaded the capital, uh, the fighting was intense. And I just love these images of the, of the patriots of Ethiopia that were fighting on the ground. One of the greatest patriots, one of the greatest fighters. And I have this question mark because I'm not sure when she passed away. Uh, she still, that doesn't mean she's still alive. She's definitely passed. But I just can't find the date. Uh, but Sherigrad Gedle was one of the greatest patriots of the Ethiopian resistance, leading the fight against the Italians, collecting intelligence, leading troops into battle. And I just love this image of her with the gun and the fro. Uh, it's just this is not a woman that you want to trifle with. This is these are this is the spirit of the Ethiopian people, not only on the continent, but throughout the African world. We see folks coming to the aid diplomatically of Ethiopia. We got the international friends of Ethiopia, of, of Abyssinia, another name for Ethiopia, international African friends. This was organized by the West African Student Union in London. There was a chapter in France. Amy Ashwood Garvey, the first wife of Marcus Garvey, who you see uh, in, in, in the image on the right uh, with uh, some West African students, was one of the founders. You got the great artist Paul Robeson, Claudia Jones, the 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 communist and and uh, black woman activist uh, of uh, uh, originally from Trinidad, but she lived in Harlem. Um, again, Amy Ashwood Garvey is with them. That's Paul Robeson's wife, uh, Aslanda uh, Robeson, uh, is there. And Paul Robeson, just as a side note. Paul Robeson, who you see in that picture on the, uh, uh, I guess that'd be to your, to, to your left, the big, tall, black guy. And I don't know who these the white folks are. I'm not sure who they are. But Paul Robeson is one of the greatest people <laughs> that our culture has ever created. Imagine, if you can, the best black lawyer, one of the best black lawyers, let's say Johnny Cochran. I, I know he's passed, but he's a black lawyer that we all remember. Johnny Cochran. LeBron James, Denzel Washington, and I'm dating myself a little bit, but Luther Vandross, whoever the best black singer is right now, all rolled into one. That's who Paul Robeson was. Professional athlete, great athlete. Whoops, I went too far. Uh, no, actually, Dan, yeah, go back. Professional athlete, opera singer, great baritone voice, stage actor, film actor, law degree activist. This is who Paul, we can do a whole class just on Paul Robeson, but I just need to talk about it. But he was also a part of this international French Abyssinia. They were pressuring governments, France, the United States, Britain, to diplomatically support the Italians. And the Europeans didn't do so until after uh, Hitler's aggressions and then Hitler and Mussolini making a pact. Then now all of a sudden they can support Ethiopia. But it wasn't until uh, uh, Mussolini joined up with Hitler and uh, then the Europeans got invaded uh, by Hitler. The, the Hitler invaded France. Hitler you know, has to blitzkrieg over England. Now, all of a sudden, Ethiopia becomes uh, an ally that they can support. But the black folks weren't waiting for that. And probably the greatest example of this is Colonel Johnny C. Robinson. Uh, before I talk about Johnny C. Robinson, though, who I love to talk about, uh, Daniel, could you play that clip um, that I sent you? I just want to give people the visual and make sure that your your sound is is shared uh, when when you when you share that. It's going to give you the option to share your sound. But this clip shows you how Africans abroad responded to the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. Is this the, yep. is this the video? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And if you could make it full screen. Necessary in my life in the cause of 
is to die and the bed of entire Africa into the Abyssinia. Okay, I'll let that play. Thanks, thanks for that, Daniel. Excel. So you th that was just a small clip of these recruitment drives that occurred. That was from Harlem, but these happened all over uh, the, the United States and in, in Europe, where Africans abroad were saying, we want to fight for Ethiopia. This is our country. So this is before the United States declared war. This is before uh, the, uh, again, the English and the French declared war. Africans were ready to fight. But because they hadn't declared war, the United States blocked those thousands of African-Americans, men and women, that went to, to sign up to fight for Ethiopia. One who they couldn't block, though, was Colonel Johnny C. Robinson. Johnny C. Robinson, let me talk about his background because uh, he connects to a lot of the things that we talked about. Johnny C. Robinson was born in uh, Florida, but I think he, he grew up in Mississippi. He, in the early 20th century, he sees a, fl a plane fly when he's a kid, and he says, I want to fly planes. Now, he was born in 1905. The first, the Wright brothers did their plane in 19, was it 1911? It was the first, I think, successful flight. Uh, and he sees a plane when he's seven years old. So this is about 1912. No, the, the Wright brothers have done their thing in 1903, excuse me. Uh, he sees a plane when he's 12 years old, uh, or seven years old, excuse me, in 1912. For a young black kid in 1912 to say, I want to fly planes, that's like your kids coming to you saying, I want to go to Mars. It's possible, and you know they're making the technology to do that, but the fact that a black kid would be able to fly a plane, people aren't thinking about that at the time, but this is what he wants to do. He ends up going to school. Uh, he goes to Tuskegee University Institute, founded by Booker T. Washington, who we talked about last week. He learns to be, becomes a mechanic. Like so many African Americans, he goes from the South to the North for better opportunities. He ends up in Detroit uh, working as a, an auto repair person, uh, and he's an expert mechanic. But he never gives up his, his dream to fly. He's also a daredevil. He builds his own motorcycle. He builds his own car from scratch. He imagines he built his own car, built his own motorcycle, got initially famous for being a motorcycle uh, 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 daredevil. And that's how the black, black world start, first starts to pay attention to him. But then he builds his own plane from scratch. I just want to remind, I'm going to say that again for effect. He built his own plane from scratch because he knew how to do it. But he still needed to be licensed as a pilot. So he goes to one of the, 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 the only flight training schools in the country. It's a school in uh, Chicago, aeronautical school in Chicago. Uh, and they, of course, don't let him in because he's black, even though he knows the science of, 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 of airplanes, how to build them. They don't let him in. So what does he do? He doesn't just say, all right, well, I give up. He gets a job working there as a janitor. And he starts, he would copy down the notes that the teachers would leave behind on the chalkboard because it was his job to clear the chalkboard. He would go and pick up any notes that students left behind and read books that were left behind. And he learned until eventually the students were started, the white students started coming to him for help with their exams and things like that because he knew what he was talking about, the janitor. So eventually the school did let him in. But the thing I love about Johnny C. Robinson, it was never just about him. So once the school let him in, he said, well, look, I know you guys don't want to teach other blacks and you think I'm special, but there are a lot of people in my community that love flying and want to learn. Let me set up the black class. You guys don't have to. I'll teach them. And it'll be at night. You, so you, you don't got to worry about the white students interacting with them. And, they'll come, and they were like, all right, fine. As long as they can pay the money. Yeah, sure. So he starts teaching other black people to fly. He starts an aeronautical club where black people will come. Him and a couple other black folks in Chicago start America's first black airport. Not for commercial flights, but these are for, for people to train to, 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 to learn to fly. An airfield, the first black airfield, first black aeronautical club. He's doing, uh, uh, he's building planes, having other, helping other people build planes, buying planes, doing tricks in planes. So he took his daredevil antics from his motorcycle stunts 
to air stunts and he's flying. And this is the 1930s. It's the same time as the New Negro movement, all that stuff going on. Very few people are flying. Very few black people are flying. And he's doing all these tricks and stunts and everything becomes well known in his group and training other black people. So it's not about just him getting the knowledge. It's also taking that knowledge back and training other black people. Well, eventually when uh, and he has a pan-African outlook, he's a Garvey supporter. We talked about Garvey last week. He, he believes and he was trained at Tuskegee, so he knows the power of education. And he is contacted by one of the relatives of Haile Selassie, who's studying in the United States, uh, and says, look, we need somebody to help train the Ethiopian Air Force. It's a very small group of people. We, we're dealing with this Italian invasion. This is actually right before the invasion uh, officially began. Because the Ethiopians weren't stupid. They knew that the Italians were gearing up for something. So he said, we need a new Air Force. At first, they tried to employ, the Ethiopians tried to employ a brother from Trinidad uh, <laughs> who went to Ethiopia and just, uh, excuse my French, but he just showed his ass in Ethiopia, for lack of a better term. He went to Ethiopia and he acted a complete fool. He had no decorum. He was messing with uh, women that he shouldn't have been messing with and causing all types of problems. So they got rid of that guy. Um, and they asked uh, Colonel, they asked Johnny e. Robinson to come to Ethiopia. He goes to Ethiopia. He trains the Air Force. He engages in some uh, military exercises against the Italians while he's there, mostly transporting uh, uh, supplies uh, to the, the, the Ethiopian fighters. But he trains the Air Force. Later on, he actually is, is responsible for uh, helping to, to, to establish Ethiopia Airlines, which is one of the still to this day, one of the best airlines in Africa. So he's known as the Brown Condor. And when he comes back to the United States, he's greeted by a parade of thousands of black people because he's a national hero for being the, one of the few black people that actually got to go to Ethiopia and fight in the war and train the Ethiopian Air Force. Not only that, He's probably more famous in the United States because he's the one that went to the U.S. government and said, look, you guys are fighting World War II. You need trained pilots, but your racism is saying we don't want to train blacks. So why don't you allow Tuskegee Institute to be the training ground for black pilots? And from that, we get the Tuskegee Airmen. So not only is he the father of the Ethiopian Air Force, he's also considered the father of the Tuskegee Airmen. So why am I bringing this up? This is the example of that spirit that we've been talking about throughout of Renaissance, throughout the first three weeks of class. This idea that Africans all over the world are looking out for each other, Africans all over the world are using whatever skills that they have. In the case of Johnny C. Robinson, it's mechanics, it's uh, aviation. We've been talking about literature and cultural exchanges, the New Negro movement and the Negritude movement. And all of this is going to bubble up next week when we get into what happens after the second great European tribal war. What happens in 1945 and 1950s when we talk about the decolonization movement, when that other 90 percent of Africa gets free from colonial rule? So that's what we're going to get into next week. We're going to look at some of the important movements, the, pan the reemergence of the Pan-African movement and decolonization movement in the 1940s and 50s. That's what we're going to get into next week, uh, how the spirit of Johnny Robinson and Garvey and, and the Negritude movement and all these things, the new Negro comes alive in the 40s and 50s. So that's what we'll get into next week. Uh, and at, right now we'll open it up to any questions or comments uh, or concerns. And we'll take a few that are recorded and then we'll uh, turn off the recording in a second. So any questions? Um, there's a couple questions. First, um, Robin had a um, question from the, from the first Q&A session. So if you um, still have that, Robin, go forward to yours. OK. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. I'm glad. Uh, let me write a little comment, actually. Um, related to um, that, and Mr. Francis' question was related to it. Wayne was asking about the similarities. When you when first mentioned the um, lynchings were for economic reasons, I was going to jump in there and go, hey, yeah, you know, basically everything. <laughs> economic base, like the, the, the 
you know, slave had an economic base, uh, the, the Holocaust had an economic base, the war in Ukraine. But then, uh, when yeah, Mr. Prince asked the question about the similarities between the U.S. invasion of Haiti and Russia, it's like, oh yeah. And so, and this the one of the, the economic thing there is that uh, the U.S. had taken take out the democratic elected president of Ukraine in 2015. Part of the reason for that is that he had turned his back on his like U.S. companies expansion and. They wanted to come in there and do what crap it was good for Ukraine to close it down for you on Russia. And then they right they turn then they turn on right. So I was having this conversation with this uh son, he's in a bottle on that. For some reason he asked me about Gaddafi and Walmart Gaddafi. Right? And I said, and part of the explanation I gave was, yeah, you know, what happened was, you know, Gaddafi was actually did a lot of great things in Libya, but he did some bad stuff, you know, but you guys ignored that until he did the fact that he did this, he did something. They're like, no, we don't like that. And then they they went out. And the people of the Ukraine war had thought was that Putin could be definitely thinking the same thing. Like we've been doing that for a long time in the US and we don't let him do that. But he's done something now that basically you know the US now has moved around the troops and he's thinking he's gonna and end up create the same fate as Gaddafi and Saddam was saying. Possible. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And and we're going to talk about the uh, NATO invasion of Libya in a few weeks because it's one of the setbacks of the African Renaissance because it wasn't just about Libya. Um, so we're going to talk about that in a few weeks. So definitely hold off on, on that because that's, uh, yeah. But thank you for that. Other questions? Um, there were two questions. Somebody asked, Will the, um, will the first videos be available for download? Currently, they are not. Somebody else asked the work that Johnny C. Robinson was doing. How was that finance? Um, which which work? I guess. I mean, the initial the initial stuff that he did, um, he financed himself in the states. Um, black the black community financed the uh, the clubs, the the aeronautical clubs, and the uh, scholarships for students that wanted to learn how to fly that was those were all black clubs this is 1930s it was all black um uh, uh institutions in terms of ethiopia that the ethiopian uh, uh government financed as much as they could and then you know he wasn't going to charge them absorbent prices because he wanted to support the war effort so he was kind of there as, almost really as a volunteer um uh, when he went to ethiopia Okay, we got clarification. They were talking about building planes. How was that? Oh yeah, he worked. He worked. He he worked. He owned a couple of garages, um, and he uh, knew how to build plane engines. Like he 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 learned it, so he would use the financing that he got from his jobs and his uh, uh, stunt shows with his motorcycle and these types of things, and just reinvest that into building planes. Uh, and then make that money back by doing planes and flyovers and and all those types of things, um, and and then continue to train other folks. So no white backing. Now, one thing I will say about uh, that I didn't mention about the New Negro movement. Um, one of the things that stands out about it is that white folks supported that uh, a lot. A lot of the New Negro movement was financed by white philanthropy in the North. A lot of these poets were able to do a lot of what they were doing because they were being supported by, uh, you know, white folks that were into black culture, which is still something that we see today. Um, but only to a certain point, because when you get too radical, then the funding kind of stops. And we saw that with a lot of artists. And a lot of these artists, in fact, when the white support kind of dried up, particularly sad is what happened to Zora Neale Hurston. Um, Zora Neale Hurston got into it with some of the white folks that were backing her because uh, one white woman in particular wanted to use Zora Neale Hurston's work without giving her credit. Um, and just because she had financed uh, her some of her studies, the white woman thought that she could just use her work. So, uh, and Zora Neale Hurston was incredibly independent. But by the time we get to the late 50s and 60s, this great scholar and writer is trying to make a living working uh, as a domestic, and there's nothing wrong with working as a domestic worker. Many of our family members and, 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 and uh, do, there's nothing wrong with that. But the fact that she writes these great works, 
but spends the, the end of her life living in obscurity in Florida uh, tells you that sometimes we need to support our own. And it's great when we have partners. It's great when we have allies and, and things like that. But we need to make sure that uh, we're always looking out for our own artists, our own people that are giving us these great works. Uh, so that's uh, important as well. So that question of financing is always important. But no, Johnny C. Robinson, self-made, self-financed by the black community and support uh, uh, by the black community. Other questions? So um, there was also that question about will the course, um, course videos be available for download? And then after that, I think Robin put his hand back. Okay, so I'll answer this and then I'll turn off the recording. Um, they, I'll check the settings. Uh, they, I know they should, they, on the course website, they're probably able to be played, um, but I'll check to see if they're able to be downloaded. Now, if it's just a matter of watching them, you can be able to, you can watch them here. You can watch them now on uh, BIA's U YouTube uh, and uh I think the, the Facebook page, if you want to watch it back or share or share with other people, I'll check the settings on the actual uh, Zoom uh, uh, recording if it's downloadable or not. And I'll get back to you all uh, next week with that. So with that said, uh, we're going to start again next week. We're going to go from the years about 1945 to uh, 1960, around 1965. So another 20 year jump. Uh, next week. So make sure you're here. Again, there's still some space in the studio. If anybody wants to come in person, we still got some space. Uh, so that's that's still available. So until next week, I'll see everybody then. And now if you, you can still stay for open discussion. And recording is off. So uh, Robin, go ahead. Anybody else that has any announcements? We got about 15 minutes. Any announcements or, or questions they didn't want re or comments they didn't want to be recorded, you can ask them now. Thank you. 